Thank you so much, um, uh, Sue. So it's uh, really my gra a great pleasure to introduce our uh, uh, a, a guest speaker today, uh, Dr. Sylvia Rosas. Uh, Dr. Sylvia Rosas is a nephrologist and epidemiologist at the D Jocelyn Diabetes Center in Boston. She's the director of the Latino Kidney Clinic and an associate professor of medicine uh, at Harvard School of uh, Medicine. She has completed medical school at University of Rosario in Colombia, followed by residency at University of Illinois here in Chicago. Uh, then she moved uh, to Philadelphia, where she completed her clinical training in nephrology, a master's in clinical epidemiology, as well as um, the Wharton Management Program from University of Pennsylvania. Um, her research program focuses on the epidemiology of metabolic and cardiovascular disease complications in patients with chronic kidney disease, particularly diabetic kidney disease. Um, furthermore, she has uh, an interest in health disparities in individuals with chronic kidney disease, particularly in the Hispanic Latino background. Um, a lot of accomplishments, um, you know, for Dr. Uh, Rosas. Um, so I'm going to just select some and say that um, she has been uh, the PI for the Apollo uh, program, which evaluates the role of ApoL1 gene in kidney transplant outcomes. She's also a PI for the KPMP program, a recruitment site at the Jocelyn Diabetes Center. She, had, uh, she has been in study sections for NIH, uh, member of the editorial board for C. Jason, American Journal of Kidney Diseases, and so on. Uh, she is the chair of the Minority Affairs Committee uh, for UNOS. Uh, she has been the secretary for women in nephrology. She has received numerous awards. I'm going to uh, list the most recent, uh, 2021 American Society of Nephrology Mid-Career Distinguished Leader Award, um, and she is actually currently the president of the National Kidney Foundation. I'm going to add a personal note uh, because I've met uh, Sylvia uh, back in our days at Penn, and you know what I'm going to say is that she is uh, an amazing, positive, energetic individual who doesn't lose her humor even after a long day on consults. <laughs> supervising her inexperienced fellow in placing a lines in the ICU. Uh, thank you, Sylvia, <laughs> for being, you know, uh, great. Yeah, thank you. So thank you very much for inviting me. And um, hopefully, you know, you enjoy the talk. I basically see patients with diabetic kidney disease in and out, and I decided today to sort of give an update on the current guidelines and talk about an exciting new medication, finerenone. Um, so thank you very much for uh, welcoming me. I was here, I want to say either eight or ten years ago. So it's always nice to come back and see how the program has grown and uh, so many of you are still here and some new faces too. Um, so these are my disclosures. So I was an investigator for the Fidelio and Figaro studies, so I wanted to mention that, but all my other um, disclosures are not um, relevant to this talk. I'm going to discuss a little bit about the epidemiology of diabetic kidney disease. I'm going to talk a little bit about mineralocorticoid uh, activation in chronic kidney disease. I'm, of course, going to go over the Fidelio, Figaro, and Fidelity trials, and more importantly, sort of the place that it has uh, in the treatment of diabetic kidney disease. So initially, uh, just a picture, a picture shows more than a thousand words. So you can see how the prevalence of diabetes is growing in the United States, and particularly in areas of the southeast. Um, so pretty soon we'll see this all in a different color, all more dark blue. And um, as you can note, and I'm focusing on the last part of the slide, maybe, sorry. maybe it's this one. Okay, I don't know how to work. Uh, so um, you can see that uh, compared to non-Hispanic whites, all other uh, minoritized groups are more likely to have diabetes. So diabetic kidney disease tends to also be a disease of underrepresented minorities. And this is the last data from Anne Haynes, and you can see you know, every couple of years Anne Haynes surveys the U.S. population, and this is comparing years 2005 through the last uh, 
survey, which was 2017, and of course it was stopped during COVID in March of 2020, that's why it's a shorter time period, but you can see that diabetes in patients with chronic kidney disease continues to rise, so it's, it's now about 30% of all patients with chronic kidney disease have diabetes. But diabetes is the number one cause of end-stage kidney disease. So patients with diabetes and chronic kidney disease are more likely to end up on dialysis. So it's our number one cause. Um, and more importantly, um, although we are concerned about kidney failure, we're also very concerned because our patients are more likely to die than they are to end up on dialysis. So it's very important to note, and I'll talk about it in the guidelines, that decreasing albuminuria is is still a very significant treatment goal. And you can see that the risk factor for cardiovascular events starts at, you know, 30 and above, and even 10 is better than 20, and 20 is better than 30. Um, so, and here is sort of the diagram about how cardiovascular death is, increases as your GFR decreases. So the treatment for diabetic kidney disease was kind of stagnant for a while, and sort of what we were doing was uh, sort of still treatment, but it was a diabetes control with what medications we had, blood pressure control, stop smoking, exercise, et cetera. Um, but then about 20 years ago, we had two landmark uh, studies, the Renal and the IDNT, and they both showed a significant, although modest, a reduction in a incidence of um, you know, renal protection. So renal was with losartan and IDNT was with irbisartan. And you can see that there was a protection about 16%, 20% in kidney outcomes. And um, those were mostly progression, uh, loss of GFR, not really a kidney failure, but uh, still very significant and important. Unfortunately, in still today, because this is data from about two, three years ago, in the United States, our patients, compared to other similar countries, are still not on the ACE inhibitors and ARBs, despite that it's been 20 years since that data has come out. And here we have Brazil, France, and Germany, and you can see that at every phase, like let's say Germany, everybody's kept on ACE inhibitors and ARB, and for some reason in the United States, as the kidney de declines, they stop it, perhaps because of hyperkalemia, but the medication really shouldn't be stopped, it should be really decreased until we can get the maximum tolerated dose. Um, anyway, then we had this explosion of clinical trials. I'm just mentioning two here. The one was Credence, which was the first trial that had kidney outcomes that showed that kind of gliflozin, which is an SGLT2 inhibitor, it was particularly good for ameliorating kidney disease progression. Again, they used the outcome of um, GFR late, uh, less than 40%, and then DAPA-CKD, also, but you can see that the gray shows that there's still residual risk. So there is a decrease in the risk, which is significant, 30%. So it's, uh, this was on top of RAS blockade. So everybody in these studies was on ACE inhibitors and ARBs. So it's not the SGLT2 inhibitor alone. They were on both medications. Um, so, um, you know, if you treat patients with diabetic kidney disease, you've heard of the standards of care in diabetes. This is published every year by the American Diabetes Association. And for the first time last year, chronic kidney disease has its own chapter. So that's actually, it's chapter 11. So for those of us, that's right. So it basically meant that there was enough data and studies, et cetera, that now we have our own chapter. And so, um, so we're chapter 11. And um, also for the first time, they put reduction of albuminuria as a treatment target. So the goal is, uh, and that's why I added it there. So some of the other stuff I'm gonna mention, but reduction, if your albuminuria is greater than 300, you should continuously try to reduce it by 30%. That's one of the goals. Um, and then this year, again, I told you it updates every year, so this was, it came out like four days ago or something like that. So this is the 2023 standards of care, and I just 
copied and pasted here the the new um, what they said about um, mineralocorticoid, non-steroidal mineralocorticoid, which is the talk of today. Uh, so in people with chronic kidney disease and albuminuria who are at increased risk for cardiovascular events or CKD progression, so basically all of them, a, a non-steroidal mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist shown to be effective in clinical trials is recommended to reduce chronic kidney disease progression and cardiovascular events. And you know, these are guidelines. We don't know that in the future we'll have more. Some of the non-steroidals mineralocorticoids are there are others that are being tested, so that's why it doesn't say have any names. Most of the guidelines don't, but that's a, that's the new recommendation, and it has a grade A, a recommendation. And then um, it's not a you know it's not that long, so if you're really interested in diabetic kidney disease, it would be um, great if you read. It's like six or seven pages long. It's not that. A big, but it really summarizes uh, the newest recommendations. And uh, sort of these are the things that have changed. Um, they basically lowered the, the, the EGFR rate for starting SGLT2 inhibitors. They lowered the ACR rate for uh, recommending SGLT2 inhibitors. I told you already about the mineral corticoid receptor. And also very important, they added the referral to nephrologist for uh, slowing progression of CKD, which was not there before, and um, and for also if somebody has continuously high a albuminuria, so despite progression, so it's there too. So that hopefully will help so that we don't have patients that have album normal GFRs, albuminurias of 2,000 and nobody's treating them. So hopefully that would be great. Um, so these are the KDGO guidelines. So the ADA has their own guidelines. These are the KDGO guidelines. This, I just copied the pyramid, and um, these, again, are widely read and established. Um, and again, the baseline of the pyramid, as always, is lifestyle factors. That has never changed. So diet, exercise, smoking cessation, weight control. Then first-line drug therapy for sort of everybody that has diabetes and chronic kidney disease would be metformin, SGLT2 inhibitor, rasblocate, statins, and then what is called goal-directed therapy. So for example, if you have a patient that needs to lose weight, they have uncontrolled diabetes, they could be good candidates for GLP-1 receptor agonists because uh, they've been shown already to decrease albuminuria, they're great for weight loss, so that might be a therapy that could be con uh, started or continued. Um, we don't know if they slow progression of uh, chronic kidney disease, but there's a study out there called the FLOW study. So hopefully at the end of this year, next year, um, so 2023, I mean, uh, we'll know if, um, if GLP-1s also will slow progression of kidney disease. And then we have um, the non-steroidal SMRAs. Again, these are for patients that continue to have residual um, albuminuria because that's one of our goals, to reduce albuminuria. And then you can see the other items there. Then, of course, there's always the merging of uh, guidelines. And I really particularly like this slide that, of course, I, I worked on, so maybe that's why I like it too. Uh, but the green is uh, every, everybody with type 2 uh, diabetes, and then the blue and, and um, sort of the blue is everybody with diabetes. And you can see that, I, of course, for, and that's because patients with type 1 are at increased risk for DKA, and that's why SGLT2 so far have not been recommended for type 1. But uh, for type 2, SGLT2 inhibitors, metformin, GLP1, like I said, for weight reduction. Um, and then in the middle, so that's glucose control. So it's like three pillars, glucose control, blood pressure control, and then cardiovascular management. And they're not like competing targets. They're all the same and they all should be, uh, you shouldn't go like one path, this path, or the other path. It's like all paths at the same time. And um, so again, we have the RAS blockade because all the studies were done with RAS blockade. And then we have, um, because it, the studies have been done with type 2 for phenerenone. Uh, we don't know. I'm assuming it's going to work for type 1, but it hasn't been studied in type 1, so it only has an indication for type 2. And then we have dihydropyridines, and we have um, on the other side statins, uh, just treatment of cardiovascular events. 
Okay, so we're gonna get into what mineral corticoid receptors antagonists are. So in patients with chronic kidney disease, with diabetes, with heart failure, which is a lot of the patients that we see, there's overall activation, overactivation of mineral corticoid receptor. And in normal conditions, they're, as we all know, they're, I, it, they're in charge of fluid, electrolytes, et cetera. But in, these pathological conditions, they instigate fibrosis, inflammation, that leads to um, damage in the kidney, the heart, the endothelium. And um, so this is what we're seeing here. It expresses more pro-inflammatory cytokines and pro-fibrosis and leads to vascular damage, kidney damage, heart damage. And uh, this, these are only two slides that I have uh, for basic science you know, for the pleasure of the people that do basic science. So it, if you have AMR overactivation and you give pay, uh, the rats uh, aldosterone, it, you can see in the middle figure that there is increase in glomerular and vascular injury, there's more damage, it's a, and you can see in the further diagram that those uh, rats that got the aldosterone had the higher levels of these inflammatory markers. And um, here is a, another, when you take out the mineral corticoid receptor, then that protects, even though you give the animals the same feed, et cetera, it protects the animals from fibrosis both in next to the vessels and interstitial fibrosis in the glomeruli. So here are um, the three uh, current uh, mineral corticoid receptor antagonists, and we're all familiar with spironolactone and epleronone, and then uh, phenerenone is the latest um, medication. And here I just wanna highlight the differences. The differences are that phenerenone has higher affinity for the mineral corticoid receptor, and also very important that the half-life is very short. So even though it only is active for about two hours, three hours, it, the effect apparently lasts all day uh, because that, that's what the studies have shown. And very importantly also, it's predominantly not metabolized in the kidney. So that is the other difference compared to the other uh, medications. And this is a, another a rat, so maybe I had three rat slides. Uh, so, but this one's just showing that the, the red is where phenerenone is one hour after they give the medication. And you can see that the, the red, you know, the little circle there, that's the heart. And we can see the kidneys up above. And you can see that it's equally distributed in both the heart and the kidney. And that's why it's thought to be different from the other medications where it does not have that equal distribution. It's more, the others are more in the heart than they are in the kidney. So I'm gonna briefly talk about Fidelio. I'm sure you all read the, the uh, studies, but just to give a, a level setting uh, information. Uh, so the Fidelio study is actually the largest study in patients with chronic kidney disease. So in, uh, they ran, and I'm talking about both Fidelio figure if you combine them. So if the, in Fidelio, they randomized 5,734 to either phenerenone or placebo, and the, the ra randomization was based on their GFR. So if their GFR it was less than 60, they got 10. If their GFR it was greater than 60, they got 20. They got their labs checked a month later which is why in the package insert it does not say check the labs in a week or two weeks, et cetera. It says check the labs in four weeks. And that's why, because that's how it was done in the study. And then everybody else got placebo, so half and half. And um, that's what this visit here, visit one to visit two, that was a month apart. And then after that, it was every four months. So the follow-up for potassium and everything else, the first month, was one month and then every four months. And that's why the package insert says that that's how the potassium needs to be monitored. Um, and then this is the composite outcome and we all know this. Um, so they have a decrease of, of risk of 18% for kidney outcomes. And that the Fidelio was done for kidney outcomes and that was positive. And those, uh, for the Fidelio, the outcome was 40% decrease in GFR, renal death, 
or starting kidney failure. But kidney failure were very few patients and renal death were even less. So the majority was this composite endpoint of less than 40%. And so here are all the outcomes. And also here, the secondary outcome was cardiovascular disease. Oh, look, they have, okay. And, uh, and you can see here that the hazard uh, ratio, there was a 14% reduction, and that was also positive for cardiovascular events in Fidelia. Okay, so that was published two years ago. And uh, what was significant is, again, we have this at four weeks because that's how the visits were done, but I'm assuming that the reduction in albuminuria happened earlier. Uh, but you can see that there was a 34% average reduction in albuminuria, and remember our target is 30% at least, so that uh, bodes well to trying to meet the guidelines, and the placebo was only a decrease in 5%, and throughout the study it was maintained. And then this is the regular um, decrease in GFR that we see early in basically all kidney medications, the SGLT2s, the RAS blockade, et cetera. And in finerenone, at the two-year mark is when you start seeing again uh, the benefits. So it does take a while. So it talks about more, uh, rather than a hemodynamic change, perhaps more of what it's thought to be decrease in inflammation, decrease in fibrosis. So sort of goes with the idea of how the, the, it's thought that the medication works. Uh, important, of course, we're all worried about the potassium and the side effect of, of giving this type of medications, but you can see that while there is a little bit of a rise in um, the blue are the people in finerenone, the red is placebo, so there is a little rise in potassium, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about it, but it did not uh, preclude people from discontinuing the medication. If you look at the supplemental pages, you can see that there were events, so 21% of people in finerenone had a, a potassium greater than 5.5, but in the placebo it was almost 10%. But more than six, which is sort of what we worry about, it was only 4.5, so it's not zero, so it does need to be monitored, uh, but it's not um, as bad as, let's say, a pleuronone or, you know, in all the trials of heart failure, et cetera, you can get hyperkalemia in 30, 40, 50% of the patients. And this is a trial that, um, the manuscript that looked exclusively at sort of who developed hyperkalemia and what are the risk factors for it. And here's the cumulative incidence of who developed um, um, elevated potassiums. And again, you can see that 27% here, there's a cumulative incident, and then the finerenone group, just another way of uh, describing it. Uh, and then this is very interesting and important because if your potassium was kind of lowish uh, before you started, obviously it makes sense that you didn't get a hyperkalemia, right? So those patients that have serum potassium less than 4.1 when they started the medication, they didn't develop hyperkalemia. And again, makes sense that those that had the lowest GFR, they were at highest risk. That makes sense. But very interesting, uh, patients with SGLT2 inhibitors, they were protected from, a, and I'll come back to the SGLT2 inhibitors, but about 6% of patients, 6 7% of patients that were in this trial were also an SGLT2 inhibitors. And you have to remember that the Fidelio trial started in 2015 to 2018 when the SGLT2 inhibitors were n initially not in the market, and then they were in the market as, as a hypoglycemic and not so much, we didn't know at the time that they were cardio or renal protective. So a lot of the patients in the study were not on SGLT2 inhibitors. But anyway, as expected, people on diuretics are also less likely to get hyperkalemic. Uh, and then of course, we know this already, that if you were on beta blocker uh, or you were on finerenone, you were more likely to get hyperkalemia. So now it's very important, and so there's a lot to learn still about how finerenone works, and one of the things that we do not know is are there beneficial effects that are synergistic or additive, et cetera, about using finerenone and an SGLT2 inhibitor at the same time. 
So there's a study that you may have heard about already called the CONFIDENCE trial that's going to randomize 800 patients in about 125 centers in 13 countries. There are also type 2 diabetes and CKD 2 and 3. So much earlier than some of the other trials, but they still have to have severe albuminuria. And again, not patients on, that have type 1 diabetes, but they're going to randomize patients to finerenone or EMPA, finerenone or placebo, or EMPA or placebo. That way we can find if there is really a benefit to the, the combination. So that uh, study has not started recruiting yet, but you know, hopefully it, it will be easy to recruit to, and uh, hopefully we'll have findings soon. Uh, so there's the Fidelity trial. So they basically added the Figaro and the Fidelio study. So the Fidelio was the one looking at kidney outcomes. The Figaro was the study looking at cardiovascular outcomes. Figaro had patients that were less severe CKD versus Fidelio had more of patients with more severe CKD. So they combined them, and this is the study that I tell you now is the largest study. It has 13,000 patients. It's the largest clinical trial in chronic kidney disease. And the key inclusion criteria are similar. And you can see here in the gray, these are the GFRs and the albuminuria that are included in the study. So this is the combination of the trials. Uh, I'm not going to go over who is there because you already know that, but the important thing to note here is that they use the same kidney outcome as the SGLT2 inhibitor trials. So the SGLT2 inhibitor trials use a, a, a decline in 57 percent versus the original Fidelio trial, their outcome was less than 40 percent. So that's part of the reason you cannot compare the studies because the outcomes were different. Uh, but using in the fidelity, they wanted to sort of try to make it similar to their other trials. And so they used the 57% kidney composite outcome. And, um, and just to show you the main results, so for cardiovascular outcomes, using that is 14%. And that was mostly driven by a decrease in hospitalized heart failure. So the benefit, the cardiovascular benefit is mostly hospitalized heart failure which is a good outcome, right? So we want to prevent that. That's the number one reason CKD patients end up in the hospital. And then the kidney composite it was 23%. Again, now using this more stringent 57%. And then the decrease in dialysis was 20%, just the kidney failure outcome. So this is another way of depicting that figure. These are the, the, the numbers, just a different way of doing it. This is the cardiovascular composite, the 14%. This is the 57 composite, the 23%. Uh, so then looking at blood pressure. So finerenone is not really a blood pressure medication. So finerenone, as you can see here, you can see the blood pressure control. So the finerenone does decrease it a little bit, but it was not overall for the whole group. It was not, it's, you know, it's not a great blood pressure medication. But if you look at the blood pressure when they started the study, you can see that those that had the highest blood pressure, which was the one in light blue, it, those had the best de decrease. So they decreased their blood pressure, like finerenone worked better on them than, let's say, somebody that had normal blood pressure. So that uh, was published recently in the journal in hypertension. So remember, these medications are given when patients that take uh, other concomitant medications. So uh, the group, uh, we decided to look at what happens when patients are on SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptors. So this is what happens if you were an SGLT2 inhibitor. Again, we don't have a lot of numbers, and this was just initially Fidelio. So you can see that in the initial Fidelio was like 250 people. So this graph is 250 people. But you can see that those patients on finerenone versus placebo on SGLT2 inhibitor or no SGLT2 inhibitor, the outcomes were very similar. So being on SGLT2 inhibitor or not, even though the numbers were small, it did not seem to affect uh, the change, any change. And, but it was very important to note that the patients were not the same. So the patients that were on SGLT2 inhibitors, their GFR was a little bit higher. They had a little bit lower urine ACR. 
and um, they were more likely to be on statins, and they were more likely to be on GLP-1 receptor agonists. So it's possible that these patients that were on SGLT2 inhibitors early on when Fidelio started were probably at centers that were, let's say, more aggressive treating, or maybe in countries that had better um, it, access to SGLT2 inhibitors compared to others. So that's why the confident trial would be very important because I don't, we cannot, well, first the number, and second, these were not randomized uh, uh, patients. So, it, you know, we can learn what we can learn from the data, but not uh, make conclusions. But um, what's important to note is that um, when they merged both studies using the fidelity, now we had 800 people, that's that number here, so we're even more uh, sure of the results, but you can still see that whether you are an SGLT2 at baseline or not, if you were on finerenone, your outcomes are basically very similar. Uh, this were, um, in the fidelity trial, these were the outcomes for both kidney disease and cardiovascular disease, irrespective of SGLT2 use. So you can see that there was really no difference. Uh, again, the confidence intervals are wider because there's less people, but the result, the point estimates are very similar. Uh, importantly, uh, again, noted was the hyperkalemia. So those patients that had SGLT2 inhibitor at, at baseline uh, were less likely to have, see here, if you were on SGLT2, only 8%, let's say, had hyperkalemia, versus if you were not an SGLT2 inhibitor, 17% of them had hyperkalemia. So this is a consistent finding that those patients uh, did better. Also very important is that um, there was no effect on hypoglycemia episodes and that hypokalemia was also not seen. So the next uh, medication that's very common, and now I'm sure you're familiar, are the GLP-1 receptor agonists. So these are Ozempic, um, Dulaglutide, all of those. And these are, let's say, the eight pillars of what causes hyperglycemia. So, uh, the, and you can see in the boxes where GLP-1 receptors work. So here is um, gluconeogenesis, gluconeogenesis in the liver, or um, decreased incretin effect in the GI tract, or um, decrease glucose uptake. So here's where GLP-1 works to increase glucose uptake to a sort of affect how hyperkalemia works, decrease insulin resistance, et cetera. So th this is the effect on albuminuria over time in those patients that were on GLP-1 receptor agonists. And you can see that again, there was no difference between those that were on GLP-1s or no GLP-1s. And again, not everybody was on it. It's not a randomized trial, but you can see that there's no difference in effect using uh, these medications. And again, it was fairly safe. There was no benefit for hyperkalemia, so we can see that the hyperkalemia was similar in both groups. So here 19%, here 18%, so it's all a very similar. I wanted to uh, mention a, a study that we're looking uh, at Hispanic patients in this population, not because we think that finerenone will work differently, but it was very um, interesting that they were able to recruit so many Hispanics, in part because there were uh, many centers that were in areas like Florida, Texas, et cetera, where there are significant Hispanics. And I brought this slide. This is the latest CDC guideline where you can see that even though incidence of diabetes-related end-stage kidney disease has decreased. If we like wink and look at this, it looks maybe a little bit better for African Americans, Hispanics, definitely for Native Americans, uh, but it's still much higher in those populations than in other populations. So uh, that's why uh, we were interested in looking at this. And um, as we could expect, uh, the Hispanic population, and again, this is probably the largest Hispanic uh, trial for chronic kidney disease. There were 2,000 uh, patients in this study. Um, but they have, um, so I think for me it was very interesting because it sort of gave us a picture of what treatment for Hispanics is in the U.S. population. But anyway, their A1C was a little bit higher, and very interesting, oops, 
it, they were um, less likely to be on GLP-1 receptor agonists, and they were less likely to be on SGLT2 inhibitors. No surprise, but uh, but it, you know it was um, nice to note and and to highlight that. And um, overall, these are the findings. Uh, we're actually submitted it for publication. It hasn't been published yet. But you can see that for cardiovascular outcomes, there's really no difference in, in outcomes, and it looks the same. For the kidney composite, it, it does not reach any heterogeneity, but I was not too impressed with the cardiovascular outcomes. But it, I'm sorry, the kidney outcomes. But it's possible because they started recruiting later, the Hispanic patients have less follow-up than the non-Hispanic patients. So maybe that had something to do because we need more time to get the kidney outcomes. So, um, but you can see that for both phenerenone and placebo, they had very similar events. So I was not too impressed with that. But definitely it works for cardiovascular outcomes. Uh, and this is something that has been noted, and we have noted this before, that Hispanic patients are more likely to lose GFR much faster, even though they had the same inclusion criteria. You can see that non-Hispanic patients on placebo, their GFR loss was 3.7 every year, versus Hispanic was 4.5. So, you know, with year after year, it adds up, so they end up on dialysis faster than others. And we had noted that before in a publication a couple of years ago. And again, you have to remember that these patients had severe albuminuria when they started the study. So we were in this area here, and we had noted also that they have a GFR loss of almost 5 mLs per year. Um, also of note, they did not seem to have more hyperkalemia, which I personally was surprised about because we eat a lot of uh, plantains and avocados and things like that that are high, high potassium. But there, there was no difference there in hyperkalemia episodes. Um, these are my last couple of slides. I think we think we still have time. Okay, so this is kind of exploratory. This is uh, outside of what. Um, so when the study is finished, Fidelio and Figaro, there is some data, which I'm going to show you, that perhaps inhibiting the aldosterone uh, may improve um, uh, or decrease neovascularization in the eyes. And um, so there was sort of a post hoc study done where they, but we looked at the ophthalmology records of patients that started the study that you know, every diabetic is supposed to have, every individual with diabetes is supposed to have an annual eye exam. So we looked for the annual eye exam before they started the study and followed it up with the follow-up eye exams during the study. And the outcomes was vision-threatening events, which are anterior segment neovascularization, macular edema, or progression of too proliferate diabetic retinopathy. And again, Remember, the studies are about two to three years of follow-up. And this is, oh, these are the, um, the studies. This is a study by Dr. Wilkinson Vector, and you can see that there's a control at the top. These are people that have VEGF, and then they get uh, ALDO, and you can see uh, that there's less uh, vascularization, less tubulogenesis, they, they call it, in the study. And uh, you can see that those that got the spironolactone, this, this SP stands for spironolactone, there was less uh, vascularization. And that was the premise for looking at the eyes in the Fidelio Figaro study. And then these are the patients. Of, unfortunately, when you go back and try to look at the, uh, these were the patients that we could find that had records. So not a lot of patients, only 134 in those that had phenerenone and those that had placebo 110. Because everybody that had proliferative diabetic retinopathy was out of this particular sub-study. And uh, these are the average age, gender, and race of the patients in the study. But in, very interesting, and again, this is all hypothesis generating and, you know, just for future studies, but you can see that the individuals in blue are those that are on phenerenone, and the individuals in black uh, are in placebo, and you can see that looking at the two-year mark, uh, there were less events. But again, I want to highlight that there was only five versus seven uh, in, this, in this cohort, but that uh, it was, um, in, in this case, this part it was not significant, but when you look at it as a whole, 
looking at the 36 months of follow-up, you can see that the individuals on finerenone perhaps did a little bit better than not having any, and this was significant, uh, they did not require ocular interventions, which right now is injections, right? And the, the attractiveness of this is that there's no oral medication to treat diabetic retinopathy. Uh, right now, what we're doing initially was laser, remember? Now we don't do that anymore because we do the intraocular injections, but still, it, it's painful and you ha they have to go every month to get them, you know, injected. So there's attractiveness to try to find an oral medication. So um, I, we're hopeful that perhaps this will be pursued by this company or another. So in summary, uh, the incidence of diabetes and chronic kidney disease continues to rise. It's very common in our patients. Uh, there's new therapies uh, that have shown promise to slow a uh, progression of kidney disease and hopefully decrease incidence of kidney failure. And uh, obviously there's more research needed. I mean, just because we have these medications, we wanna really understand how they work. We don't know if they work in type one diabetes. We don't have any data on pediatric patients. Uh, we don't know the combination therapy. Should we start everything at the same time? Like if we see a patient that has 2000, should we start finerenone, SGLT2 inhibitors, maximal RAS blockade all at once? You know, and why not? You know, in cardiology, that's what they say. They have like the four pillars of treatment and maybe that's what we should have too. So these are the people that I do research with day in and day out. And I wanted to invite all of you personally to the next sprint clinical meeting in Austin, Texas, where we'll be discussing this and multiple other interesting topics. And then this is my Twitter account and my email if you want to contact me and I'll be happy to answer any questions. I have a couple of questions for your practice that sort of one being compensation for and how difficult you find that. Yeah, so you know, I have the I don't know if the, the word is the blessing, but I'm, I, I work in Massachusetts where there's universal health care. So it doesn't mean that there's no obstacles because just because they have insurance does not mean that they don't put barriers to get the medication. So there are uh, PAs that you have to be filled out. We do have sometimes to certify that something else was tried initially. Uh, that's why it's so important that the guidelines change because initial interpretation of the last year's ADA guideline was that patients had to be on SGLT2 inhibitors and fail SGLT2 inhibitors to get started on finerenone. And so that, I think, delayed uh, the use of finerenone. Uh, and so hopefully with this new correction, that hopefully won't be an issue anymore. Uh, because that's the, the correct interpretation of what the guidelines were trying to say. Um, and um, so, yeah, it's not, the company has a voucher program, but you have to not be in Medicare to use it. So it does have, I, I agree that there are um, issues with a payment because they are now more expensive because they are on patent. And so I actually had a conversation earlier this morning about could we get the same thing with other medications? And the thing is that we don't have that data. So we don't know, maybe, maybe not. And, uh, and we do know that they have side effects that are, uh, you know, gynecomastia, who wants to get that? Or hyperkalemia, or we have to monitor their potassium more often. So, so we have what we have and, and that's, yeah. Yeah, if they have albuminuria, and it depends on the age too. Like if they're 90, because I have 94-year-old women that come to my clinic. So, 
and their GFR is 75, maybe there's no need to be so aggressive. If their blood pressure is okay, et cetera. But I see very young women, 25, 35, et cetera, and with very normal GFRs, but very high albuminurias, and they should get everything. <laughs> Oh, I continue. Yeah, I, I, but you know, it's not just medications because I tell them, okay, did you exercise? Are you following the no added salt diet? Uh, are you, uh, you know, how many steps? Show me the steps. You know, I think you have to make a plan and hold people accountable. And, and you know, the problem with diabetes, or I don't know if the problem, but the issue with diabetes is that it doesn't go away. It doesn't take a day off. And then sometimes it's very hard for patients to, uh, monitor their diet, their exercise, their medications, their uh, CGMs, their, you know, they have the glucometers, you know, it takes a lot of effort to really manage everything. So, it, you know, I think when they come to clinic, they should be supported and really encouraged and say, oh, great, your A1C came down 0.2, that's great, or you lost three pounds, great. This is so much moving forward toward our goal of you know, this weight or whatever. And I do write the goals, and, but I discuss it with them. And it's like, oh, you know, your weight, I usually do this, like, oh, you're 33 BMI. Uh, to get to 30, which is where we wanna be, uh, you have to lose, whatever, 10 pounds. So let's plan on losing 10 pounds for 2023. And so I write it in my note and I start, okay, started this day and, you know, and patients say, in general, they, they come back and they say, oh, I lost six pounds. I know I was supposed to lose 10, but I think, it, you know, and so on. I, I think if you have like goals, like, oh, you're walking 3000 steps, that's great, but you should really be 7,500. Why don't we do this? And, and so if you have a plan like for exercise, for um, diet, for weight, for blood pressure, et cetera, and you remind them because they're gonna be, they actually come and they tell you, here's my blood pressure log, here's my weight, here's this what I do, and I, I know you're gonna get upset because my A1C went up. You know, they even tell you because you've done it already, you do it every four months, you know, they know what you're gonna ask them, so. Yes, Dr. Badia. Oh, okay. <laughs> hmm? Hundred <laughs> percent. So if they know, they have not shared it with me. I don't know exactly what the molecular um, mechanism is. My understanding is, um, or throughout the studies, it's been shown to be less hyperkalemic than the other medications. Um, but I don't know, it's supposed to be the way it, act, it, it acts, like it doesn't get metabolized as much in the kidney anymore, and that that's, well, that's the, what the explanation is, but um, that's all I can say. It was a hard question. Yes, I don't. I don't have the answer to that. Mm. 
Well, the study was three years. So all of these events were what happened in three years. That's the average follow-up. Any other questions? Yes? So KPMP, so we have uh, patients that are on it and patients that are not on it. But there is a, an investigator that is trying to get patients to do two biopsies, one before SGLT2 and one after SGLT2, which technically is how it should be done. Uh, I don't know how successful they will be in recruiting patients that want to have two biopsies. Oops. Uh, well, I finished the talk, so I don't know why I messed up something here. <laughs> so, um, so that will be done. I don't know how many patients they'll recruit. Maybe even if they recruit five or ten, we'll know something they, different. Yeah. But right now at, at KPMP, we have patients that are on it and patients that are not on it, and so we could still draw some comparisons, uh, but um, but it's not the same. One more question, Sue, yes. Remember that when they start, at least uh, now, and in the study, there were like you could have a low, a, a higher GFR if you had retinopathy. Like they, there was some inclusion in the inclusion criteria. So even from the trials, a little bit skewed because of the inclusion criteria. But um, and but there was no follow up like. The, we don't have their eye exam or their follow-up eye exam before or after SGLT2. But that's why I said, like, the topic is very interesting. It's super, I mean, it's great for patients that there are options now, and I think it's great for nephrology because there's so much to be done to study these medications. I think it's going to take us years, decades maybe, to really understand how to um, prescribe them or what subgroups are more likely to respond, what are the risks, et cetera. So interesting times for nephrology. You all picked the right profession. Okay. Thank you very much.